Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, the microphone is working. Welcome back. Uh, the third day of DEF CONF is about to start. I hope you are enjoying the conference and that you enjoyed the party yesterday. Before I start, we start a little bit of housekeeping. Please, when you leave the room, come to the room, be careful about slamming the door. It, it's really, really distracting. And also, uh, respect the full sign. When you see a sign on the door that says it's full, well, surprisingly, it means the room is full. Please don't enter. We'll be happy if you, uh, if you tweet uh, or if you, uh, if you write blog post. So um, go ahead to do that. And today, there's a grand finale, a competition for cool prizes. Uh, in room D105, 105 at 4.30. With this, let me pass the floor to Fabian Arutin with his uh, talk, Centos Infra Revealed. All yours. Thank you. Hopefully the microphone is working for me. Yeah? Or well, I can scream, anyway. So, um, good morning, everybody. I was not expecting many people in the room on a Sunday morning for the first time slot after the party. So, uh, but here we go. First thing, who am I? Uh, for people not knowing me, you know, yeah, just quick summary. I'm a Belgian guy, meaning that obviously you can speak to me about Belgian beer, um, French or Belgian fries or chocolates if you want, but that's a little bit off topic, obviously. Apart from that, I'm uh, seasoned mean by choice because I really like what I'm doing. This is, I mean, for the CentOS uh, infrastructure. Um, CentOS user, I would say, even abuser for a long time, and I'm a member from yeah from the CentOS project as well. So, what do we want to cover today? A uh, little bit of history first, um, where we are coming from, and hopefully where we are going to. Um, a quick overview of the infrastructure and the way we are doing more and more interaction with other distribution, like obviously Fedora, because we share. Uh, the same routes, and so working with the Federal Infrastructure Team is really something we are doing at the moment. So, back a long time ago, um, when there was the big split between um, Red, Red Enterprise Linux and Fedora, some people said that, oh, there is suddenly a gap that some people have to fill. And so, more than 10 years ago, some people decide somewhere in a basement just to say, oh, let's start something for fun, let's try to rebuild uh, the social PM. And it was just a few private nodes, right? So KB is just at the back, he would, he would ev you know everything about the machine that was maybe running in his garage or basement just to do that, and Johnny uh, in the US. So it was really, really, really small. And I don't think a lot of people were expecting the project to become su so, such, so successful at the time. But, you know, it was something homemade. It was really um, just people doing that on their spare time uh, because they like it, but we had all our jobs and we had just some free or spare time to spend on that. But there was a, suddenly a need for automation because everything was running from almost one or two machines, like the main website was running on, on the machine, the forums, the, ma the main mirror, everything was on single machine. Then people from the community, and that's the beauty of the things, the C in CentOS is community, right? So people from community said, we like you because we use it. So what can we do to help? Well, we need machine and bandwidth. So we had one machine here, one machine there, one machine there, another machine there, and it's, con well, the microphone is scratching a little bit. It's my... Okay, let's try to not move. That will be the, yeah, I don't know. Ah. Let me just try to. That Sunday morning, take it easy. Here we go, hopefully. No, not better. I can scream instead if needed, but let's try not to move. So um, the current situation is that we have, obviously we are just eating our own dog food, so we are still running CentOS 5, 6, or 7. 
But I, in fact, the CentOS 5 node, yeah, there is only one node at the moment still running CentOS 5, which is Xendom 0, hosting some virtual machines, so we just need to move that uh, somewhere else. Uh, but we still have some machine running CentOS 6, and obviously the new machines that were go given to us were donated to us are running CentOS 7. We started to reinstall because some machines were donated almost 10 years ago. So we started with the machine running CentOS 3, then reinstall in CentOS 4, then in 5, and we just continuously re reinstalling those machines. Because we still, you would be surprised how much, how many um, say Pentium 4 we still have in production at the moment behind the board of CentOS Rogue with one gig on RAM only and a single SATA disk. So it's always fun to deal with those machines. So those machines at the moment, we can't even reinstall those machines with CentOS 7. Yeah, let's reach, yeah, maybe. Otherwise it will be annoying. Let's, oh, one, two, one, two. So, Back to the thing, it was still running on a lot of donated machines everywhere. So we had most of the machines coming from company in the US, um, some in Europe, in the Europe, and one machine in Brazil, one machine in Malaysia, one machine in Australia, something like that. So we were just, in fact, um, reinventing the cloud before it was a thing, in the sense that we had suddenly to, you know, uh, automate a lot, a lot of things uh, because we had no time to work on that. So. Um, Puppet was still a thing. So I re even remember in 2007 at Fosdem, we had Luke Kenny's in the CentOS distro dev room just giving a talk about Puppet, which was uh, beginning to start to, 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 be a, to be a thing. So we came with, I migrated from Puppet to Puppet. I think I was migrating from Puppet 0 to two, the 3 uh, to yeah, multiple version, and at the moment we were running 3.6. Um, the thing we did was, was to switch from Plain Puppet Master D. Uh, how many, how many pu people are using Puppet in the room? Oh, not. So the rest is using Ansible, maybe? Yeah, or Salt, or whatever you want. So we switched from plain Puppet Master D to Puppet and Foreman. We use Foreman as an external node classifier. It was mainly for a Puppet dashboard. And, um, and then we are, we are just separating every uh, variable from the module. So everything is coming from, from Foreman. And still, um, we started to use a little bit of Ansible for specific ad hoc tasks um, between machines, or even what Brian will explain that in the next um, talk in the CI environment. About monitoring, because when you have machine running, um, well, all over uh, all around the world, you still need to do some checking. So we decided a long time ago to use Zabbix. The main reason was that, well, KB and myself. Um, we were using Zabbix for our daily job, so we just decided to use it because it was um, it fits uh, the bill. So we have uh, Zabbix agents install all, all the nodes. The only problem we had was to that we had to use Zabbix proxy. If you are famili familiar with Zabbix, you know that um, you have latency issue. So you have we have to use um, Zabbix proxy sometimes to get information. Um, from those machines, because the, the topology of the network is geo-distributed. Geo One thing we do, well, we, we are still doing is, uh, for DNS, nothing fancy, you know, we are just using bind, like almost everybody does, except that we have um, geo-redirection. So we have a delegation for some of the nodes, some of the record, like if you try to hit mirror.centos.org or msync.centos.org, you will be redirected to your geo-IP the, the nearest machine um, from your, for your location. So um, that's transparent for a user, but that's really something efficient at the moment. And even if people are not really supposed to hit those machines quite a lot, because normally you just hit mirror list and you, you download the package from your um, mirror, um, one of the external mirror, some people are just using plain mirror.center.org and we have, in a, on average, 400 requests per second for those D, uh, DNS um, record. In the, um, yeah, we obviously have some of the things. Let me just put some notes. Yeah, that's better like this, for me at least. We have other uh, machines, uh, obviously website, forums, bug tracker, mailing list, um, and torrent seeder for people willing to use the torrent tracker. One of the nodes that is really crucial for 
us and also for you is um, the msync role. That's how we distribute the, all the updates and all the, the new release to Excel and Mirror. We have at the moment 16, 69 donated machines uh, dedicated for that role. We are just using a pyramidal setup where from the master we just distributed to the level zero, the ring zero, and then the other nodes. From a statistic point of view, when we're pushing new release, the um, aggregated value for those nodes is actually pushing to four gigabit per second du during two or three or four days, depending. And they are just used f to seed all the external mirror. We have, we at the moment, we have something like s more than 600 external mirror uh, that most of the people are using, not counting the, the people using an internal mirror for production, obviously. So we have, as I said, we have a lot of mach uh, machine in the US, a few uh, in Europe, but some parts of the world are not really well covered. Like I think we have just one machine in South America, and the machine is, is in Brazil. Um, the machine has uh, not, a bad uh, not a good connectivity, but on the other hand, <coughs> internal to the country, um, the machine, that machine has a really good speed. So it's really quite slow for that machine to get everything from us, but when the machine has everything, uh, it serves all the other machines in South America. Same like Malaysia, you know, we are in 2016, but we uh, still have some machine connected at 10 megabit per second. It's not even limited at the router, I mean really connected at 10 megabit you, if you look at ATH2 on the machine, because it's really um, uh, limited at the, uh, the switch level. So why do we want to keep those machines? For the same reason. Because 10 megabit per second is really slow here in Europe, but in Malaysia it's still a thing to have a machine in the data center connected at 10 megabit per second. So it's quite a nightmare for us to manage to have that machine up to date, to distribute the update to the other machine, but it's still something that when you are a user, you are happy to, to face that machine in that region. How do we uh, verify that? We have a process. Um, we are not using Mirror Manager. A lot of people are expecting us to run Mirror Manager, which we don't at the moment. That's something we can eventually do in the future, but um, if we speak to the Fedora people um, to see if we have the same problem to solve. But at the moment, we have a process that check in loop every mirror for every release, every repository, and also the ISO file are checked per country. Meaning that if you, well, that's transparency, um, but we have no base URL in the YUM repo file, that's, you know, the mirror list thing. So you are, s once again, redirected to your nearest uh, mirror. And same for ISO redirect. If you want just to download um, an ISO file from us, you're also redirected transparently, and it's check in loop. The fun begins with the donate machine, because everything is fine. A company said, oh, I want to give you a machine because I like you, and obviously I like free gift, so I accept the machine. And almost all the machines are running on those donated machines. But it's sometimes, well, you have, we had to migrate the role multiple times, because you receive a machine, but you don't know if the machine will stay for one month, one year, or 10 years. So we just have to automate every, everything because we will switch the role. Sometimes we add to, uh, well, there is a hardware issue because machine is more is maybe 10 years. Um, we had last, for example, um, in two months time, we had to migrate the, the wiki. That's just a fact from last year. We had to migrate the wiki instance three times in a two months window because, you know, the machine was moving from one DC to another or um, the machine disappeared or had an hardware issue. That was really some of the problem we are facing too with. Same for the mailing list, we had to automate all the things because you don't know when it happened. The machine can just disappear. And the main reason why a machine disappears is not hardware issue. It's just that the company doesn't exist anymore. That's really something we had a lot. You know, you have bankrupt or even something more fun. You have company A giving you a machine. Someone inside of company A gives you a machine. The guy left. Management is not aware. Company B acquires company A. And sometimes company C acquires company B. And suddenly you have no contact anymore with the people giving you the machine. The machine still runs. Sometimes they are just, well, they do an inventory and they say, what the hell is the machine in the DC? So they have a name. Um, 
and we have notification. If they are smart enough, we have notification that machine, you know, well, we are not in interested in sponsoring you anymore, so we don't care. Sometimes they don't. So we just discovered by with Zabbix that machine is not reachable and we try to contact the people. Nobody's answering the phone or something like that. So it happens to us quite a lot. The more interesting thing is that when you know that the company went bankrupt, but the machine is still running. So w we don't know who paid the bills, but we have machine in DC still running. We just cross the finger to to hope that there is no, there will be no, you know, electricity outage in the DC or out issue because we know that we'll lo lose the machine. But machines st still run, and that scares me when the machine runs without any inventory. But that's that's a good, that's the fun part of uh, managing those machines. So what we do with those donated machines? Um, the first thing we do is obviously just reinstalling those machines. Because I don't know if you have already tried to use a dedicated and donated server, well, a dedicated server somewhere. Sometimes they are smart. You know, they, they provide you Fedora, Ubuntu, CentOS image, official one. Sometimes it's a bastardized version of CentOS. Like, I don't want to name OVH, which I did, but they just have a ver um, different kernel they force you to use with GRSEC instead of uh, SLinux, for example. Some other DC guys are just injecting directly their own SSH key into root account or things like that. So I, I'm a lazy guy. I don't want to audit the machine. I just reinstall it directly. So how do we do that? Because obviously we have no, you know, it's a single machine in a DC. So we just, with a simple script, you, we just reinstall the machine. So we just on the machine, as long as we have SSH connection, we just download the kernel, the initRD. We just install KaiExec tool. Uh, we inject the Kickstart. I guess that a lot of well, you are all familiar with Kickstart. We inject the Kickstart in the initRD, and we just chain and we reboot on the kernel. The machine auto reinstall itself without any IPMI or connect, uh, VGA connection at all. Um, when the machine reboots, Puppet is called um, for the certificates, and uh, yeah, it starts uh, it starts configuring the machine for us. Meaning it's yeah just allowing certain IP to just SSH into etc. What we do is that we start small because the first thing we have to do is try to build um, a relationship with the company willing to sponsor uh, us. Because as I said sometimes you don't know the company, so we have some random guy somewhere willing to sponsor the, the a project. So we have a machine. We start with something really non-crucial, like we have. Uh, I mentioned the M-Sync role, so uh, mirror machine. We start with that because what can happen? There is no data, there is nothing in it on except package, which are GPG sign, right? So at the moment we start with something like that. And what we do usually is that we just, before putting the machine officially in the into the mirror network or into production for something else, we just test their support uh, response time. Because some DC are really fast, it's cheap, it's free, right? It's donated, so there is no SLA on the machine. But still, some people like us and so are uh, giving answer to ticket we create quite fast. Sometimes it can take days or weeks uh, because of that do donated machine. So we just start with something really um, s small. And with the time, we know if we can trust those people or not because they prove they proven that um, we can use their services so that's sometimes we have to we are lucky in the sense that they want just to sponsorize uh, to, to sponsor two machines in the same DC which is because we are not this traditional on premise thing we have machine everywhere so sometimes we have two machines so um, we can do some kind of failover thing like for the DNS at the moment uh, we we have machine where we can just switch um, from one to the other if needed and we know those people, so we know that we can use uh, their support. Apart from those machines, you know, that people are facing uh, for Mirror, we have also um, other resources, like uh, in a DC at the moment, we have four physical nodes that we use um, for what we call the dev cloud. So people willing to um, work in a special interest group in CentOS can abuse resource in that dev cloud, uh, dev cloud environment. It's at the moment still op uh, based on Open Nebula. So people can just spin, uh, spin uh, a VM quite easily. And uh, we are just using Luster with InfiniBand. 
um, to for the storage part of that. Um, if you are interested in details why we had to switch to InfiniBand instead of using uh, standard Ethernet, feel free to ask me uh, at the end of the presentation. It's running at the moment quite fast, and um, we are even thinking about expanding that because we have more and more people interested in abusing that environment. Apart from that, um, when I mentioned donated machine, I should say that obviously um, two years ago something happened with Red Hat. I guess that people are aware of that. So the biggest sponsor at the moment is in fact Red Hat because they sponsored some uh, IBM Blade Center in uh, IBM facility in a uh, Red Hat facility. So we uh, have our um, dedicated build farm, the Koji build farm, running uh, in that environment. And it's basically at the moment just, uh, it was only Intel x86-64, uh, but we added recently uh, ARM64 um, as well, builder, in the, that environment. And in a remote uh, environment, we have also uh, PPC64 and PPC64 LE, because probably you are aware that we release support for those architecture um, in December. Same for ARM HFP, so ARM v7. If you have a Raspberry Pi 2, feel free to abuse CentOS 7 on it. It works. And next to that build environment, uh, really next close, because it's in the same rack, we have our CI environment set up. If you are interested in the CI environment, Brian will explain uh, all, the de all the details about how you can use it if you are a member of a project in a special interest group. At the moment, it's also it's Jenkins driven. If you just visit HTTPS CI.center.org, you will recognize automatically Jenkins uh, UI. Um, we have some uh, um, chassis that we uh, are using with compute node inside. So it's a 256 compute node that we can abuse for that. Um, we do bare metal for CI, Brian will explain that, but do we do bare metal because we want to be as close as possible to what happened in reality. Because we have RDO people uh, building on top of CI, so on, on top of CBS, so if, for example, you just want to yum install OpenStack, CentOS release OpenStack, you can. It's built on CentOS, for CentOS, and distributed uh, uh, through the mirror. They want obviously to test the whole thing, so they want bare metal, because then they can simulate everything on top, including the VM. And nested VM is, yeah, maybe not that not that good. Uh, in the back, it's just Ansible that is provisioning and reinstalling, re reinstalling all the machine, um, all the physical machine, um, as fast as possible. So, the roadmap for the CentOS infra is extending the authentication because. Puppet take care, um, takes care of, of, of the accounts of all the machine at the moment for the infra team. But still, we had more and more people interested in contributing to the CentOS ecosystem, so including for the special interest group. So they needed access to the Koji build farm. Instead of using our own, well, it was a custom-made CA script and wrapper script, we decided to, to, to move to something that uh, a lot of Fedora package are known already. So it's uh, we have accounts.centos.org, which is backed by FAST, but not the Fedora FAST. That's the FAST uh, backend, but on our own uh, system. There is no federation at the moment between the two. Something that can be maybe done in the future, we don't know. <coughs> we obviously want to um, start to migrate more and more web services uh, to, uh, to that uh, centralized authentication. Because at the moment, the forum are still using their own um, um, local database for the user, etc. What we want to do also is um, a faster update going to Mirror because we are faced with an interesting problem. We have a lot of machines with uh, limited capacity, and we have more, 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 and more package and update of package and cloud image. And that's uh, that it starts to become a problem for us on those donated machines. So we are just rethinking the way we will, we will distribute all the, the machine through some kind of caching and CDN for the, the infra, based still, still based on the donated machine. And some kind of uh, message bus, um, we are still to think about that. If you have ID, feel free to share about how we can uh, speed up um, communication with the external mirror. That's basically already the end of my talk. So if you have question, feel free to raise your hand. Yes. Not reintroduction, uh, no, what? 
Yeah, so the question is, do you run some kind of uh, intrusion detection system? More or less, well, through the audit, um, because if we see that, for example, it happens to us that some people in the DC just had to m do uh, maintenance on the mission without notification for us. So what we just do is just reinstall the machine completely automatically. Because everything is automated, is right? So it just after the, the, the time, the time is just needed for the machine just to sync everything back from another machine in, uh, nearby. So we consider those machines like, you know, pets and cattle. So those machines are cattle. We, we have the machine, we are happy. The machine is gone, nobody regrets it, right? It's not like if we were losing the, well, the main machine like git.center.org, which is not running on donated machine, obviously. Um, but for those kind of machine, no, we don't. We, we just reinstall the machine directly. Other question? Uh, yes? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, Puppet, because you know you describe the state of a machine, and we started with Puppet a long time ago, so we continue to use Puppet for that reason. But when you want to do some orchestration, uh, Puppet doesn't do that. You know, the Puppet master decompiles a catalog, and it's just for that node. If you want that node to interact with another one, then begins the fun. Especially, for example, consider the uh, the main issue that I, I had myself with Puppet and, for example, the, com the configuration, man configuration management in general is the fact that you don't have a clear view between Puppet Master D and um, the monitoring system. The only way to for the to configure the um, the, the Zabbix interface maybe well for us directly is to use something else that you know traditional way of Puppet of doing thing is you use exported resource. And then you reuse all those exported resources on the mon on the monitoring machine to just apply all those configuration. Sometimes it's, ris it's really crazy because the more nodes you have, the biggest the catalogs it is, and the biggest time. Well, sometimes it's 30, 35 minutes just to verify that nothing changed and that the they are monitoring the correct thing. So I'm just using a kind of you know workaround at the moment. Um, I said that we are using Foreman. In Foreman they have hooks. So it's it's a event uh, driven. So if I update or create or delete host at Foreman, I have a script that says I have a, tab a matching table said oh that puppet rolls as that tap it, uh, that um, monitoring template in Zabbix. So if a machine is changed uh, with added or remove role, it automatically use the hooks to just um, use the Zabbix API to add or remove the roles at Zabbix. And using the same thing in both ways, if Zabbix say that, oh, that machine is gone, for example, it reflects that directly through the Foreman API. Um, the way I use Ansible is like, how do you install Puppet, for example? You have to start from somewhere. So at the moment, it's fun that you can just use an Ansible playbook to bootstrap Puppet itself, or even set up Puppet Master D. So, and some ad hoc, uh, ad hoc task like we use uh, we abuse Ansible for like uh, uh, as I said reinstalling the machine automatically with the Jinja two thing for the kickstart uh, in the C environment the machine are reinstalled on average hundred times per day that was me what we did so it just well it's trans it's it's transparent in the backend Puppet doesn't do that so you know that's really different if you like um, w you can use the two if you you can discuss with the Foreman guys. They just did the integration with um, Ansible at the moment, meaning that you can just use. Uh, you can still continue to use Foreman as external node classifier for Puppet, but at the same time, you can have an inventory script to use Ansible and point to exactly the same um, inventory. And you can even, with a callback plugin, have all the reports from all the Ansible playbook calls directly back into Foreman as well, like you do for Puppet. It's quite cool if you if you want to use it. So. Other question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, so the question is, I mentioned Gluster and InfiniBand. Why? Um, we had a space constraint in the rack where those, um, where those machines are hosted. So it's just a four machine setup at the moment for the dev cloud. And we need a shared storage. So at the moment, every machine is at the same time hypervisor and cluster storage and client. We started with you know dedicated uh, gigabit Ethernet connection for the storage. But then I realized something. Like, uh, um, I don't know if people have played with cluster in the room. No, 
Gluster is really damn easy to set up. But it's so easy to set up that it hides some um, problem. Something you have to understand with Gluster is that, well, it, it's turning now into a Gluster session, but I don't mind. Um, if you are running a distributed and replicated uh, setup, your Gluster, in fact, it's just a metadata server, meaning that if you want to replicate it, it's the client's responsibility to send the data twice. So if you are just doing that over Ethernet, your bandwidth is automatically divided by two. And can you imagine the fact that you are, your virtual machine is in fact, you know, the I.O. in the virtual machine is really bad. So we uh, try to optimize that just by switching to InfiniBand. If you look on eBay, you can find um, 20 gigabit or 40 gigabit InfiniBand for almost nothing those days, including for HBA. And instead, you, you know, you can use InfiniBand in two ways, like, you know, the traditional um, RDMA thing, or you can just use that with IP over InfiniBand. So you treat your H InfiniBand HBA like a normal uh, 20, gigabit, uh, 20 gigabit Ethernet card, in fact. And the only thing you can do to speed up that is, um, well, it's the same for storage. If you are using iSCSI, you know that if you want to tune iSCSI, you are going to jump a frame. So you can do the same with in InfiniBand. You have um, connected mode versus, versus datagram mode. You switch from one to the other. It's more or less the same thing as jump a frame. Uh, once you do that, and if you are using Gluster for your virtual machine, you just need also to switch to libgfapi and not using Fuse, please, because Fuse is really, really everything but speed. So uh, switch to, to that, and then everything starts to fly again. So, but it, the reason why you decided Gluster was, you know, we had no central storage and we need a solution on, so using the, the, the machine uh, both as hypervisor and storage node. Does that answer the question? Okay. Other question, maybe? We can discuss about that later, maybe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, some people sometimes try strange thing through. Um, but yeah, we can discuss about that if you want after. That will be yeah. I will have not have time enough <laughs> enough maybe to discuss that. So. But you still need a pair of gloves. <laughs> Another question: Last chance to win a pair of gloves, Santa's gloves. No question. Okay. Thank you. Oh yeah. <laughs> You you want you want gloves, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, the torrent for uh, for uh, for the YAM operation, no, but. Um, <laughs> That would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we discussed with the, the those guys because, as said, we have also uh, CentOS 7 ARM HFP, which is there. But we decided to go with ARM HFP, so ARM V7. So um, our target was not ARM V6. So it only works on Raspberry Pi 2 and Kubitruck and all the other board, but not Raspberry Pi 1. Red Sleeve guy decided to be compatible with their own legacy thing, meaning that it, they were targeting ARM v5, which is really older. It still runs on Raspberry Pi 1. So I, yeah, if they want to join the fun and benefit automatically from the ARM error, they can just be part of CentOS and, and build ARM. Well, DNF doesn't exist at the moment in, in RHEL 7, but yeah, you said torrent. Yeah, um, for for the YUM part, I don't think that you will. Well, YUM YUM itself has plugins, so maybe if someone has a crazy idea like that, but I I don't think that it exists at the moment, and that would be quite interesting to you know, YUM install thing and and starting a torrent client in the back. Yeah, that means that you have a yeah you have maybe a big big mirror. Well, no, you have a you have no mirror and you have a big big infra because um, a wall a wall set of package for red sleeve maybe something. Well, for CentOS Seven is the same thing. It's not that big. 
and if you if it's starting to become big uh, only if you have you know a lot a lot of release in parallel and a lot of architecture so pretty sure that they they have some mirror to answer your question they have some so I don't think that using Toron would be good for that just to distribute to other machine but not for the client part you still have you still have some gloves no question thank you Slice on this uh, flash drive. Can do it now if you have time. I can show you. Yeah. 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 So the is where you muted, okay. and unmuted, but we had some problems, so we are not going to use this one. It, it has to. Sure. I think it's fine. It's just you know sometimes it just goes and yeah, it's weird. I can do this one. Okay. Sure. Okay. Sure.
too many brands to keep. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Uh, so there are some personal preferences. You mentioned that you still understand what you're doing on these, which is yeah, really cool. Yeah, it's so cool. Really, it's just like 